Okay, well, this movie synchronistically came into mind for everybody at the same time. It arrived two days ago, or a day ago. I, I ordered four, four different ones from that, from the producer of these films. Yeah. Just felt like a really good movie. So none of us have seen it, but I think just the idea of some of the more progressive thinkers from the West going over there to be with the Dalai Lama, I think it, it's like the case of, if Course in Miracles teachers came to visit us, it would be more focusing on transfer of training and practical application and not just tossing about ideas. Because I think some of these figures like Fred Allen Wolf or Barbara Marks Hubbard or whatever, they, they kind of known for their thinking, like Barbara Marks Hubbard is known for her futuristic, the futurists and everything, but of course we know from the Course that the future is a defense against the truth. So it puts a whole different spin, so I'm sure they're coming to be with the Dalai Lama is, is more like a symbol of opening their mind more to transfer of training and living the experience, which Dalai Lama does quite well. So, uh, so yeah, it feels like it's it will be kind of a movie, kind of flushing, flushing the ego out of its comfort zones and concepts in toward a let go, which is really good because that's extremely practical. That's the best kind of movie. <laughs> of seeing that happen. We have so many transfer of, kind of, uh, transformation of consciousness movies where the main character goes through a major undoing, and so I think it will be good to see that. And in that sense too, it puts things into context, like a lot of the quantum teachers and a lot of teachers basically can talk about the ideas pretty well. And you can see the sparkle in their mind, in their eye, which is this I think are just a reflection of the openness of their mind, and yet that's the beginning of the journey. It's not the end of the ego thinks, so. Oh, come into quantum, do hawks and lectures, and hit the circuit and whatever. But we've already seen the movie Decoding Deepak, where his son takes apart his father uh, and shows all of the areas where Deepak is not transferring the training, he's afraid to see his hair cut off and they take his little, what's the Blackberry mm -hmm. device away. He's, he's not so happy and they give him a simple little room and he's great with the, sharing the ideas in books. He's, he's a great articulate uh, one for that and he, he's used as a symbol from the spirit of bringing many kind of from the spokes a little bit inward from the, the outer realms and head them towards the center. But then Dalai Lama is just a nice symbol of, of actually being in the practice of it, you know, being chosen, the Dalai Lama, kind of through prayer and or through devotional stillness. And then now Dalai Lama has come out and said, I'm the last Dalai Lama. So he's ending the tradition of all the Dalai Lamas, uh, which is a bold kind of thing, which is kind of a symbol of, of leaving traditions behind and going for a state of mind. And uh, so that's been pretty shocking. I think that's what the Chinese have wanted all along, is him to be the last um, Dalai Lama. And then he comes right out and says, I am the last Dalai Lama. And they're probably like, whoa. Because <laughs> they, you know, they, for their own reasons, they didn't, didn't agree with what he was saying. But, you know, I think that's a pretty interesting thing too, so. And I did get a chance to talk to, I think Desmond Tutu might be in this. I had really good conversations with Desmond when I was down in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And part of the thing was that <clears throat> uh, they were having Desmond's into inclusiveness. He wants, he wants everybody included and represented and, and Desmond really adores the Dalai Lama. They have so much fun laughing together and Desmond was making jokes when we were there. He's like, they're trying to make me retire. He said, looking around at his staff, and he's probably up in his 80s, and he with a big smile on his face, like he had no intention of retiring. But I was aware, I talked with him, he, he still connected with his Catholic system, so uh, when they were going to have Dalai Lama come down to uh, South Africa, and the South Africans would not let him in the country, which disturbed Desmond, because that was his friend. So then, 
they were having a conference in Rome with all these different spiritual leaders from around the world, and then Rome would not let the Dalai Lama in. So he had a few things to say to the Pope, and the whole Vatican structure, Desmond did, even though he's part of it, he said, this is just not right. So this is not right. This is not the spirit of love and inclusion. So, so I think there's a couple people in this film, at least, you know, that are really like spark for God <laughs> of being inclusive. And, uh, and I think also we'll see some of the Western people going there and kind of pushed out of their comfort zones. Maybe that's part of practical application of, of trying to live it. So. But that's all I know about it. I think we'll have more commentary after the after we see it than before. Because I just saw just a few clips. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Go for it. Without the course, it's quite a, a, a mind is quite a thing to navigate without the course, because you're you're not coming from the top from the awakened state. The course is so yeah, it's it's a it's a big thing, a big pill to bite as it is. But you can this is good. It gives a little context to things because there's you know there's a lot of ideas and and as far as putting it into practical experiences, but you can see the the one that's doing the main speaking there, he's, he's, you know, not really into materialism. We have seen some really good videos recently about exposing, what was the one, was a TED talk that was banned that you sent me or something? Was that group of children? Yeah, that was really good. It was banned TED talk. And it was really good. And the Asian guy in this book? No, this guy was a British. Rupert Sheldrake. Rupert. He's from Manchester. That's right. And he went through like ten points, which was really good, just undoing the whole thing of materialism and the whole bias of of Newtonian science. He did a really good job. That might be something we could watch sometime. So it's really brief. It's a really brief talk, but it's ten Maybe ten points, and he goes through them pretty quickly. All the assumptions, yeah. Oh, so I would love to finish that. I only saw the first five minutes. Of it. Yeah. Mm. The children. <laughs> now we first mm. we paused it with three monkeys. Now <laughs> <laughs> I like our little pause points. That's quite quite interesting too. This is Fred down here in the left front. <laughs> He's had, he's been sick, it's been a long ride, and he's, his stomach is not agreeing with what Emma is, is, is saying. <laughs> so we can, we can pause it there. So then all of us, you know, you can do it with whether it's your own experience which seems to be in your body or even your experience living here in community at, at the Camus Metaphysical Center. Because it's whatever you experience in your world relating to your body or those around you in the environment that you seem to live in or whatever is, <clears throat> it's just a microcosm of the whole cosmos as if there's actually some kind of world outside of these walls. Like, you could, you could do it with your body, or you could do it within these four walls. And then here he's just saying, if there are practical problems and issues, if you have emotional issues, if you have issues of, of faith, if you're still struggling, or he said there's two types of spirituality. One, doesn't he doesn't care what your theology is, if it's Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, Zoroastrianism, it doesn't really matter, but it's just this care for one another, sharing, you know, what if there's issues around that, but it's like, it's like we can go into the conference with him, because he's just showing up there and he's just being very practical, like if there are issues of experience that are not harmonious, and he said his whole philosophy is that the whole purpose in life is happiness and joy. 
So anything that's a contradiction to that, then, and he's talking world terms, and we know since it's all just perception, then you could use it very well within your own experience with the body, or outside of the body in your immediate vicinity, it would work just as well as if you were talking about countries and governments. I mean, he talked about poverty and hunger. Some of you probably still deal with those thoughts, maybe on a daily, weekly basis, about, or have, have a, some thoughts that cross your mind, or some of the uh, other ones that he's talking about, you know, it's still kind of apply it. So it's interesting, we'll see where it all goes, but it's good to kind of go at it, instead of you're watching a movie of Dalai Lama, but you're just, you're there at the Synthesis Conference now, and you are a full participant and at the end of the movie you'll get to not just make a declaration statement like he says, but hopefully be more engaged than than just that. Like governments do that. The governments all come together and then they say, and here we are going to release a statement now. You sure you haven't seen this film? <laughs> I haven't, no. This is beautiful. <laughs> That's what this is about. Yeah. Practical spirituality. Mm -hmm. I had to write out a the title, Lisa and I are going to Tony Ponticello's church, CMC. I had to write out a title of a sermon about making no exceptions and forgiveness, and then and then a, a description, and send, send it to Sarah to send to him, and then title of a afternoon workshop, and then a description of that. So, we're going we're gonna to go there and be transparent and Talk about making no exceptions. So, it's fun. It was an interesting morning with this movie. I don't feel like I've ever had these thoughts before, but when I was seeing the poverty, you know, like, that was the first time I started to have like, these thoughts with it. Like, huh. Like, I don't know. It's, it's probably just a hypothetical. I was just thinking, like, how would I actually experience it if that was a like, Oh, right in front of me, I guess it was. <laughs> I was like, oh, it seems okay here, but like, what would my actual ex you know, experience be? It's, I don't know, it was just it was interesting. Just thoughts were starting to float up, like, that looks unfair or something. <coughs> so, it's helpful. <laughs> We can pause it there. Already they, they set up light structure, but mm. there's a big pronouncement from the witness, who were supposed to be mute witnesses. He was a witness? He was a witness. <laughs> he was a witness. <laughs> that was a witness, and all the witness did was talk the entire time, objecting to the structure that was set up, just reacting to the, the structure of, of a group of sitting around the table that would be talking you know, it, so it would be like if we had our lunchtime expression session and then the people would sit around the table and eat and then we would just have a group holding the presence of love for non-judgment during the expression session, almost like a symbolic ring of just holding the presence on the outside, not just purposely standing there to not judge or react to anything that is, is being spoken. I think that was kind of their intention right. there, and we can, we have a real nuance for that, but you can see, here's some guy who's probably published, and he's a progressive Western thinker to even get invited to be a part of the Census program, and then he's invited in to be a mute witness, and he's not happy about that assignment. But it's, you know, you can start to see the reaction to even the, even the lightest of structures. It's quite interesting. I was talking to this woman in Australia who's going to come and be part of our community, Helena, but she had, I guess she was sent to the website by Ricky to fill out the devotional stay application, which is a common thing, and then in there it talks about limited um, like conversations with family and use of cell phones and typical things that over the years, we've found 
just helpful for people coming for a short devotional stay. She's seen, she's coming, this is her whole life. She's listening to the Father every day. She's having major kind of experiences and everything. And she had a, she's had a little bit of a reaction to say, why are all the limits? Why, why am I coming into a community with, with all these limits? And I said, well, I had to give the context of it, of the whole thing, but I said, no, you're not really. I said, we really, at the core of our guidelines is just two. No people pleasing, no private thoughts. Those core guidelines are designed <clears throat> to open up if there's anything hidden or kept down and repressed. It's, it's designed to bring them up, up and out for healing. And she said, oh yeah, I like those and I want to love, I just want to love everyone. My, she's got five brothers, three of them are studying the course in Colombia, her father's tilting towards the course, and she, I, I love maybe once a week talking to my family and how's it going with the course, and we have very purposeful communications, and why, why would I not do something like that, you know, so it's good we got into the whole context of things, whereas a lot of times people come and, for example like with Ricky, her brother, sister, mother, you know, believe she was joining a cult and working with the devil, the more fundamentalist, you know, it's a, it just gave her the whole context. There are some that actually that benefits, because <laughs> you know, they don't, every one of those encounters it's like, uh, you know, because it's, you know, you have to build your confidence and strength in the miracle, so. But I, I yeah, it was interesting already, and you see Fred is kind of smiling there though, he's, <laughs> <laughs> He's probably looking at the irony of like, here we go, and the witness has done most of the talking. First he was telling Amit that he was dominating the conversation, now he gets thrown in his first little small group, and the mute witness does more talking than anybody else. They can't even get going to have a world cafe, because the mute witness is, is so bent out of shape. So <laughs> it's, pre it's pretty funny when you look at it. <laughs> Getting back, my voice like this way. <laughs> That's what was underneath that outburst. I'm just getting back my voice like the slaves. <laughs> That's good. And um, that's what we're trying to create. Okay, we can pause it there. So in this community, there's sometimes this thing about messengers and non-messengers. Mm -hmm. And the messengers, and it's like, do we hold that container? Or do we let that container go? And is there a value? You know, they've invited these participants to come, and then there's, there's others that are saying, let me in. Let me in the container. And then sometimes there's some that are in the container that can get me out of here. <laughs> get me out of this container. It's all just thoughts. It's all just thoughts. And, and so the structure that even seems to be there, or the levels that even seem there, are symbolic. But, but again, you know, the, the guy that came in that was the mute witness self, the first thing he was hammering at was the hierarchy. There's a hierarchy here, there's a hierarchy. He was very upset at being a mute witness. And, you know, in the point you start to really bring it back to, like just to take it so deep enough to say, wow, that's, that's the way projection works. To see something through the body's eyes, to see something in the world that you do not like. But it wouldn't even be there to perceive unless you wanted it to be there. You couldn't even perceive a boundary, you couldn't even perceive a, a, a like they're, they're calling it, what is it, a container. You couldn't even perceive a container unless you believed in such things. So it's all, what we're saying is that it's all consciousness, it's all mind, and the only rest that 
that you ever can have and come to have in the mind is to see that it, you can't, it doesn't come down to unique expressions, it doesn't come down to individual contrib contributions, it doesn't come down to a synthesis of parts even. There are no parts. The parts are made up too. And it doesn't come down to cooperation between the parts. Because there are no parts. It's a, it's a, it's a vertical alignment with spirit to coming back to pure oneness, the unified field where everything is one. And so this is, this is a good movie for that. Because you can see that the same, you can see that they're showing the, the monks, they're showing old footage from the 50s, they're showing current footage, they're showing the motions of the monks and their discussions with great passion and vehemence. And then you can see the, the synthesis group is there and they're getting very passionate and talking about <coughs> 45 minutes is not enough time for synthesis. The chaos has emerged in, tw in the, the time allotted that you've given us. Chaos has emerged. And the one guy said that we are here to let all that come up and bubble up. He said, there's no one here who's coming in and expecting the, the same that they came with. Mm -hmm. When actually, that's very spiritual. If you really came with holiness, with forgiveness in your mind, then you would actually, you could come with it and you could leave with it. You could come and leave in the very same state of mind. The very thing that the guy was saying, none of us are here are going to do that. He was meaning it more as come egoically stuck and with something and leave in the same thing. But that's pretty much how, how it goes as long as you believe in the ego. You always, everything is like a kaleidoscope just shifting around. But there's the same discontent, the same unrest and conflict in the mind until you forgive. And then when you forgive, it's all the same. You do come with the same purpose and the intent, the same state of mind. And you do leave, so to speak, with the same state of mind. When that's your sole intention, when that's your single intent. So it's, it's kind of, it's a good movie. It's got a lot of, we can bring it, keep bringing it back to what we're dealing with in a practical way with thoughts on a daily basis. You know, not about, we're not coming together with a summit every day in the cafe to try to solve the world problems. We, we've got one problem that's, it's enough, and we're told it's already solved. But we, we must not be defining it correctly if we still perceive that it's still there. If, it's, if we're told very certainly that it's gone, it's already gone. So it's good, I like these little reflections. Like we're right there with them. We're going down the the, the rabbit hole with them. Okay, I think anytime you see one of these kind of films, whether it's Dalai Lama or Martin Luther King or. Marian Williamson, you know, the, the, the leaders, the spiritual leaders that, that people feel a resonance with, but that are appealing more to the masses, are those that, that speak a lot in, you know, you can hear an essence coming of where they're pointing towards to try to find a solution, but yeah, I, I just always am given more and more appreciation for A Course in Miracles when you, when you watch these. You can, you have a much, 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 much greater context for how simple this is as compared to the complexities of the world, where it's still just, it's like the prayer wheels just spinning round and round and round. And you will see, even among them, you saw people that were into quantum physics, but political activists and the whole panorama and the range. and. At the end, you know, even the ones telling where where they are now, you know, they kind of these kind of thought patterns just seem to keep perpetuating. But you know, for yourself, it, it just really brings it back to like a value of really 
waking up with gratitude every day that you're in, you're, you're seeing a reflection of a world or even a community or a personality self, but it's all reflections of, of this real devotional practice that, you know, they kind of came around to in the end, more seeing that we have to change, we have to get, face the Tibets in our own mind, which, which we really came around to starting to see that it's a perceptual problem, which is what we talk about all the time and not to get caught up into trying to fix the world or change the world as if the world is apart from from mind and consciousness so to put full attention on that and I think just from your experiences you can tell that even that takes quite quite a focus and attention and an effort on a daily basis just to face whatever clouds are crossing the mind, you know, they use the word confront, having to conf confront evil, confront error, confront, just take a look at it. And how beyond concepts of like countries that are, you know, like Tibet and China, those kind of things and this and this, the, you can reel it back in, as I was saying earlier, just to how do you experience your own, you know, awareness of the body, what goes on with the body. The body itself is just a symbol, but it's like a cosmos in and of itself. So everything that you experience with the body is is really cosmic. It's not it's not really a microcosm. It's all the same. And the same, you know, with the two commandments, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and might, and love thy neighbor as thyself. So any judgments against a brother or sister, just even using this community, you know, that that's just a perfect cauldron or a perfect trial for practicing, you know, what he would call compassion. But I, I had an interview recently with this woman, Olga, who I did on compassion, but it was going but more towards true empathy, coming into what's real and true, and being able to stay with that, having the, the desire to stay with the truth, not to try to solve something that's not, not really the issue. So yeah, I get to see it has, this has a lot of, everything we watch has, has great practical application, but this, you know, it seems to play out in the scale of Westerners going over to, to meet the Dalai Lama, but you can see that, like he was doing with the example of the mosquito, it plays out in a much, much more direct way than anything like that. And all the seeming projects that we work on, and all the seeming extensions, or recently the focus with the mystery school and everything, it's it all comes back to a state of mind. Coming to that consistency of peace, stillness, not desiring to be drawn away from that, to drawn into perceptual conflicts that aren't really real, or interpersonal dramas that aren't really real, just watching the, the mind when it wants to be drawn into something like that and just being able to say, mm, I, I don't want to go there anymore. I want to use my mind's energy for that kind of movement. So I think it's, uh, it's good. What did everyone see? Did anyone have any big aha moments or insights with... Yes? Uh, but yeah, it was just when I started to get into this whole discussion of, um, you know, we've got to have a long-term strategy and, you know, we're going to bring people together and we're going to keep having these discussions, I just felt this kind of sense of, of like, 
it's just so exhausting. I mean, you know, I, I just, it's like 40 years ago, I think I realized already that that doesn't work, you know, in terms of my parable. But, um, you know, it's just that, that idea that somehow it's that, that way of trying to fix things stays, even, in, you know, in seemingly in the mind of the Dalai, Dalai Lama. This idea that we can, if we get everybody together and just work things out, we can solve the problems of the world. And I mean, we, you know, that's the whole thing of history repeating itself. It just keeps going on. It never actually gets fixed. And yet there's almost like a blindness to that. That's the sort of experience that, that I have when I watch that kind of thing. You know, how many things does one see like that, you know? But we're going to solve the problems of the world. <laughs> and, and as you say, I mean, there's just, there's got to be just, you know, there's got to be another way. That's really what it comes down to. Yeah, and so, you know, when you talk about the Course giving us that other way, I mean, it really is it's very, very meaningful to me. I just have such a strong sense of the futility of that. It's like that thing from the Bible, Ecclesiastes, you know, meaningless, meaningless, a chasing after the wind. It's like what, it's what humanity has been doing forever never worked yet because it can't you know. so it's a great insight in that if it's if that's if it's not that that's one of those netty netty not that mm -hmm. <laughs> and and you can see that clearly then 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 it's more there's an opening in the mind an opening in the heart to see that means and end are the same that, that you're there is no doer doing anything is a means for future doings. It's the whole construct of the doer is a denial of presence. The whole construct of a person, of a sentient being, or a, of a compassionate person, or of a loving person, or of a peaceful person, or even a happy person, is a complete contradiction in terms, because the whole personal perspective itself is a denial of what is, of what Byron Katie would say what is. So, you know, I, I saw in there that I could feel beneath the words and the symbols there's a call for simplicity, there's a call for experience, there's a call for happiness, there's a call for what they call core basic human values which aren't really human at all. Love is not really human. And and that we don't have to try to mix that. That when you come into an experience and you experience your identity as that experience, then the words are given in a very involuntary way. We saw Dalai Lama at eight years old and then we'd see him in black and white footage, then we see him in 1959, you know, coming out of Tibet and into India and, and over the years, and now current footage, but but all of that is, you know, underneath it there, there is a much simpler solution, and, it, and it's, it's, it is one of motivation, he called it, we call it purpose, and, and so on and so forth, but it's, it's, Atonement might be equated with total escape from the past and total lack of interest in the future. There are no future generations. There is no future solution. There is nothing long term or short term. It's like it's coming to a realization that the atonement, the correction, right now involves a total escape from the past and a total lack of interest in the future. And then you can just feel that the carefreeness, the, the, you might say, I don't know mind, the, the uh, sense of openness with that, the energy is with that, the spontaneity with that, the newness with that, everything is, that's everything. And this idea of trying to reconcile anything, or even reconcile the words, or figure anything out about anything in the world, you know, it, you have to come to an absolute realization that, that it cannot be figured out, ever. And that all for, 
frustration comes from trying to figure out what was made to never be figured out. A, a projection, a smokescreen, it wasn't designed to be figured out. It's like a trick, it's a riddle. You know, it's, it's an unanswerable question. And so this, this is really, you know, I think by watching movies like this and working with these ideas that we're working with, you know, this should be a contrast experience. Like, like I don't need to save the world piece by piece because it's not a piece by piece solution. I don't need to do this one person at a time. All the rhetoric of, you know, supposed to really get you interested after a while, it just, it doesn't. It, you see that it's impossible. It's impossible. To wake up with a happy heart and to, to give yourself that much permission to just be happy regardless of whatever the form seems to be, that is not a small thing. You could tell that's that's what the reflection was. The laughter, the happiness, I don't understand. Behind I'm a simple monk is, is there is a simple spirit that's behind this mask and behind all appearances. And that's important, you know, that that's that's reality. You'll see different ideas there from the different thinkers and about, you know, you create your own reality. The common thing Emmett was talking about at the beginning with quantum physics, that's, that's nonsense. There's no, there is no creating of reality. It's already been created. It's, it's eternal. It's, it can't be manipulated. It can't be changed. It's just what is. And the human beings have nothing to do with that. It's just the construct is blocking reality, we'll say, from awareness. So, you know, a lot of the, even the progressive ideas are still, it's still the same old, same old that you were talking about. It's, and it still seems to involve like a, a, a group effort, a collective. There's no collective. Collective what? You know, you, you have to have something to collect. I mean, there aren't separate minds and consciousnesses. There aren't separate sentient beings. You know, it's you have to see past the whole, the whole thing, in the end. And how glorious it is that we, you know, we have that opportunity just to be happy, just to be happy. I was talking to that woman Helena who I met down in uh, Sydney. She she wants to join us devote her whole life, you know, it's pretty rare, we you know, we, for most times we're saying, no, come and, come to a gathering or whatever, she's, she's already done that, she, the father told her, type into Google, when is David Hofmeister coming to Sydney, Australia, and that's how she came to the gathering, and then when she was at the gathering, she just was like, I want to love God, I want to serve God with all my heart, I'll go anywhere and I'll do anything. I have no reservations, I have nothing holding me back. And so then th that started the, the connection and then I guess fill, I was told by Ricky to fill out an application and already came in today, yeah. came in today but the, the reservation was, you know, I want to love every, I, what do you mean my communication is limited? She did. She reacted to the idea that, that what we were teaching is limited, involved limited communication. I said, no, 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 we're not. You know, those are just guidelines and context, but it's it's not for everyone. You know, it's <laughs> and we had a meeting the other day where it's like, can we agree? Messengers meeting. Everyone who comes, must, go through the mystery school. And I said, well now, you have to bring the mystery school to the saint and see if, if that lasts. You know, sainthood, state of mind, will dissolve every construct. You can't think of it in just in terms of running people through some kind of a model and thinking that's going to produce something. It's, it's a state of mind. The greatest thing that could happen to this place is have the Christ show up at the door and go, 
I don't believe anything you're talking about. And to go, thank you. Come on in. <laughs> I'd like to meet you. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you know, it's not, it wouldn't be surprising that Jesus will start sending us reflections of what we're all praying for. Which is, there's only now. And, and, a, and a happiness, and a joy, and a laughter. All these seeming collaborative projects are all just for a state of mind. <coughs> Jesus doesn't mind if you sit around in lounge chairs and watch movies and laugh and eat, eat popcorn. You know, there, it's not like there's an external world to save, but it's, it's, if there's not exuberant, he says in Lessons 163 and 167, that anything that is not supreme happiness is death. That means everything that's not supreme happiness is death, without exception. He even mentions a little sigh of weariness. Death. The bar is high. <laughs> a little sigh of weariness is death. The bar is high. And we're praying for that experience. What's the, what's the whole point of self-realization? What's the whole point of what's on our wall? No thyself. Thyself is not some collective experience. Because there is no collective. It's just giving yourself fully over to, call it whatever you want, just happiness if you want to keep it really simple. You know, self-honesty about happiness, that's a good, good place to start. Am I happy? If you want a koan or something, there's a good one. Am I happy? That's really... He was saying it at the end, you know. Oh, it's happiness. We don't want to die. <laughs> we want to be happy. You know, he was really getting pretty strong and forceful at the end around that point. Interesting point. That he was very animated about, you know. We don't want to die. We want to be happy. It's very simple, very direct. So yeah, it's, I join with you in not, not giving your mind over to thoughts that really actually go nowhere and aren't even there. <laughs> you know, they, they aren't to be believed. They aren't to be given faith. I've, I mean, I've had to listen for 25 years, people have said to me, they'll get me over to the side and they'll say, David, you have to reach people where they are. And I said, oh yeah, where are they? Let's look at that. If they're the Christ, that's where they are, so to speak, then, then if that is your devotion, then it will come through in the most loving, joyful, appropriate and helpful way. And particularly with one-on-ones. When you're in a crowd, Jesus tried it with crowds, and again, there was only one, one self anyway, but the ego is legion. The ego was not too happy with this simple message. It had one response. After three years, it, it kind of finally delivered its response. Crucify! Kill him! Get that voice shut down! <laughs> you know, because it's the ego's world, and the ego, of course, you know, doesn't look with kindness or charity on anything. It's, it's, it's a death wish. It finally exposed, you know, it kind of came out in the raw, came out naked, kill him, crucify him. That's what it always was and that's, you know, what it always will be until you see that it's not a reality. Then that's when things get funny. But until then, it's, you know, it seems like a serious, serious thing. Anyone else have any feelings while they watched this movie? I love, I love Kalame. Kind of like, uh, the laughter, like, that, uh, expressing just, it's 
It was like a nice contrast, like all this kind of complicated, and then he's even said it, this is complicated, and just started laughing. But also, I think just, I haven't had that experience too often, um, just with this sense of, uh, like, when I was perceiving poverty, and, all, and then just, uh, kind of like what Charles expressed, yeah, I just noticed for myself this sense of, um, Yeah, like, uh, yeah, hopelessness, just in, in that sort of, in that sort of way, again, touch, touch with that. And I guess just, um, which is a good thing, but seeing like there is only one way, you know, like, there has to be, the mind has to have its perception healed. It's really the misperception of all that. Um, just having to yeah, confront all of it. Um, I don't know, it just, it, it really felt really personal somehow. Like, I really felt like I was on that journey and I felt like, oof. I don't know. It, was, it, was just, it felt really personal. It was good. Yeah, I'm thinking of what Jesus said in the Course. He said, it's not that you ask for too much, it's that you ask for far too little. Well, if that's the case, if I've just been asking for far too little, then what more could I ask for? What about miracle principle number 23 from A Course in Miracles? You can heal the sick and raise the dead because you made sickness and death and can abolish them both. How about that for setting your sights on something? Instead of will I be a messenger or you know will I get to travel and teach and all these foolishness. How about go bigger than that and go for Oh, I can heal the sick and raise the dead. You know, open your mind to the possibilities of what this is really about, because that's where the fruits come in. This woman I've been talking to that, about coming over here, Helena, she, she did seem to, you know, get sicker and sicker and sicker and was kind of laid out and really was going through the dying process and, and Basically, it was just laying and couldn't couldn't move, just felt like she was dying. And then there was one thing that came into her mind, and the, the idea was, this is only a thought. It's the one idea that came into her mind, and with that, she thought, hmm, then I can drop this thought. And then there was seemingly a corresponding, you know, recovery in the body. But it started with, this is only a thought. Because whatever you're going through, if, if it's only a thought, that can be changed. Changing, changing your mind about that. But there's a lot of power right in that tiny little example. And you know, this, that's what this is about, that's what this whole awakening is about, that's what this community is about. The properties are nothing, the practices are nothing, really the rituals, whatever they seem to be, are not it either, but it's, it's just coming fully to accept the power of, of the mind, and that, that a thought can be changed, that something that was thought can be unthought or changed in some way and yeah that's very very impactful that's something that really didn't fully come up in the whole conference but but for us it is something that's that's coming up I can change my mind I have the power to change my mind it doesn't matter what I seem to make I can change my mind about that 
and everything will change accordingly. I mean, that means everything in the entire cosmos, because the only thing that Jesus says any living thing can know is what it is. It, it can only know its identity. It doesn't really matter what the form seems to be. So, I think that's, that's really powerful when you think, wow, here, I'm just at that point where I can face that. And all the other issues that seem to be issues, like the big complexity that, oh, Tibet's complicated and this is complicated, everything about the world's complicated. An atom is complicated. Everything. But identity is not. It's not simple. So it's beautiful that we have that opportunity to change our mind about identity. Regardless of what seemed to be made, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. I think with that, there's lots of laughter, you know, it's, it's, this, anything can be funny. Politics is funny, that's why I, have, I, I get to, to open my browser and just, it doesn't matter what it is, it's funny. I think, I think for myself, um, just something I've been noticing happening with me, maybe I'm sure it's always been like that, but it's really been my face lately, it's just when there seems to be a reaction to something, um, my experience of it is that it kind of, uh, at least lately, takes over pretty quickly. And, and then the way I experience it, it's like I have this amnesia and I, I, like I forget or I don't know how to like, let go of the thought or change my mind. I guess I'm seeing some sort of value in it. And, and, um, There's some been noticing some deep frustration with I guess the fact that I'm valuing conflict. You know, I can't let it go. That means I must want it. Um, I heard a line in a movie I just watched over in Masterpiece that's in my collection and uh, it was called Deja Vu, but, but the line that's delivered is, maybe there is no such thing as an illusion, it's all just the truth coming closer. I mean, there's the, always the power of interpretation, so when there's this sharp judgment or conflict or whatever, if it, even if it seems involuntary, like it's, you call it like almost like a knee-jerk involuntary reaction to something, that that there always is. It's just the behind it is the truth coming closer. It's just there for a fleeting instant that that you can behold that which is real. It's right beyond it. it. The frustrating thing can be time, if you, if it seems to linger more than a fleeting instant. That's what this whole world is, is trying to draw out and distract and make seem long what really isn't even there. So it's, to, that's the frustration of it, but nonetheless, you, you have to feel the gratitude of it, it just even coming into awareness for for healing, you know, there is there there is a huge gratitude underneath it, as you can tap into. It just seems so out of the human awareness. Like, why would I be grateful for such a horrific feeling and a horrific judgment? But but it is the truth coming closer. It, it is the mind has given itself permission to let it up. 
up and out. Yeah, I guess like a specific that's in my mind right now is um, I can't remember all of it right now. Um, just the other night with Utah, there was basically there was just a misunderstanding in my mind. It just got so quick and then so vicious that I my experience and I don't think it's the truth is I felt like I you know, I lost control and then there was just so much projection being thrown at you too, which was un, you know, not necessary. And then basically she was trying to get some space and I felt like I couldn't help but I was following her and then she'd like back off and we'd actually go outside and get some space and I was like It's like what the fuck is going on? No. And I've tried to just, you know, not like, push away or anything, but just try to like delete, you know, um, like, let go of the past, but it. It just feels so dark and <sighs> like murder. I don't know. It's <laughs> yeah, it's 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 really what you've signed up for. You know, I mean, how many workshops would you go to? How many gatherings? How many communities would you visit if they had as their slogan, you know, discover the the Hitler within? You know, or expose the Hitler within, you know, the, the murderous, vicious thought. Jesus is quite, quite dis descriptive actually in the Course, so it's like, it's, we're, we get a clue when we read the book, and we listen to those sections that we, I speak, and to those workbook lessons, you know, there's, we're, we know we're going to have to have to face whatever comes up, as, as vicious as it may even seem to be. But, it's also a sense that, that underneath it, that you know that that's what you're here for. You're here for the healing. You're not here to push it out and project it out and into the future, you know. Some thousands of years from now, maybe, da 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 da, you know, it's more of like they were saying there, we have to directly face things, and that's what's happening. So, in that sense, instead of trying to hold it, you know, if somebody gave you a, a hot coal, you, would, you wouldn't try to hold it. You, you, you would drop it. And, and more and more you start to see that those things may come, but you, you will become more and more willing to drop it. It's just shocking to you to think that you could hold on to that for a period of hours or whatever, of stark raving madness, like feel like l lunacy, you know, lost, losing total control. It's that's a very scary, scary emotion. But, but it's also something that's been pushed down there, and we can't, we can't be free of it without allowing it to, to come up and pass through, you know, to be to see it differently. So it is self-forgiveness, you're just forgiving the the darkness, you're forgiving the self that you thought you were. I feel so responsible for it. Yeah, that's the thing, of attaching the responsibility everyone talks about, but he says in the Course, you are not responsible for the error, you are only responsible for accepting the correction. You are not responsible for the error. So that's a, a saving grace again that comes in. He's saying, no, do not go there. You know, because then it just holds on to a personal identity, is that persons can do wrong or persons can do right, and it's just, it's a never-ending circle and loop if you, if you go down that way. So, you know, it's, there's an enormous opportunity here for forgiveness, you know, in the deepest sense of forgiveness. 
and the ego, when it comes, it can be very horrifying, very, very horrifying. But, you know, again, you don't have to stop, you don't have to stop there and be paralyzed and frozen in that, in that horror. And when you think of it, every day when we have expression sessions, every joining on the, the mystery school, every slight look or glance in the kitchen or in the hallway or anywhere, you know, it's like, really, honestly, you can look at every day is filled with thousands of opportunities of profound release. You know, a miracle, Jesus says, can save thousands of years as the world judges it. One miracle can save thousands of years as the world judges it. And we're here for, to be miracle-minded, to have many, many miracles, and save millions of years. You know, even those parts in the Course about the separation occurred over millions of years, and the reparation might occur in a longer time, he says. <laughs> People go, is that supposed to be encouraging? <laughs> but but that's all just metaphors of time. You know, he's really saying, no, no, come, come with me into forgiveness. Come into this presence. Feel the innocence now. You know, he's drawing us, and anything that's standing in the way comes shooting up into awareness. So that feeling you're not doing something wrong. You know, again, you know, we're all joined together in this. That's why you're here. And you're here for atonement. You're not even here to be Saint Nicholas, even though there could be, you know, that could be a symbol along the way. Nikita would, would always say, um, forget that the Holy Land is over in the Middle East. We have the Holy Land right here. And, and we, have, we have the gathering of, of all saints. We've come together to be the gathering of all saints. I was just singing, that was that yesterday, I was singing to this group uh, out there, oh, when the saints go marching in, when the saints go marching in. I'm meaning, here they come. The, Jesus is going to start sending us the saints and we're called to be the saints, because if not us, who? You know, it's, it's like if you open your mind to atonement, what would you expect <laughs> to come out of that, you know? of accepting the correction for the whole error of all of time and space. So, you know, that's, it's opening your mind in broader parameters to let your self-concept be shifted radically by Jesus, you know, into more expansive self-concepts that are far beyond what the world recognizes. I think Arden and Persis said that during this, this next, um, I maybe it's next century that, that there'll be like teleportation and things. Why would we doubt that? I mean, if you look at what's happened in the last hundred years, why would you doubt teleportation, you know? And and wouldn't that be a whole different context, you know, instead of, did you, did you purchase your airline tickets and what flight are on, do you have an exit row or this was, you know, it's, you know, this is, a, this is a mystical reflection of mind, and we can't put too much of a lid onto the possibilities. We have to kind of remove the, the limits of, of what's coming. Not to just look back into the past, of past generations, that they, they're born, they grow old, they grow sick, and they die. Well, that's, so what? That was the best. They're born, they grow old, they undo, they release, they teleport, <laughs> they teleport all over the place, <laughs> and they ascend. <laughs> it's a little different story. Why not? Why not? Who says that, you, that, that, that can't be done, that that can't be a, a, a symbolic representation, you know? We have to, we, Jesus says, it's not that you ask for too much, it's that you ask for far too little. So, let's stop asking for far too little. 
and we're not going to use stories from the past and and doubt thoughts and fear. You know that that day is over. It's you know it's that's what's the past. That's history. I got in touch with, I mean, I feel like I've seen it before, but it just really was in my face, this, um, this, like, deep desire that I, like, need to be punished, you know, and, I mean, there were, like, images in my mind, like, whips and whatnot, but it was intense, like, I didn't really realize it was like that in my mind, and then I was getting past memories of just kind of growing up, and you know, self-discipline whenever I misbehave, and like, either kind of slap in the face, or when I was much younger, <coughs> spanked, and, and just realizing, um, why well, I don't, like, it's so far beyond what I know for there not to be punishment for a seeming mistake. Like, I just really, I really have no idea what that is, or is like, you know, it's just like, I, just, I was getting honest with myself, like, I really, believe in, in getting a mistake deserves punishment. You know, especially for myself. So I mean that was kind of, I don't know, I felt pretty uh, profound in myself to kind of notice that's what was going on. At least one level of it. So, but yeah, I, you know, I don't want to stay there. I, I want to feel this innocence, feel that seeming mistakes don't require punishment, they don't deserve punishment, in whatever form that is, you know, really it's, I was feeling it mostly in my mind, and it was actually happening to me, which actually was a big surprise. Yeah, it's just, a, it's again, it's a retranslation from from, we'll say, sin and punishment to mistake and correction. You know, mistake, mistakes do call for a correction, and, and there are no such things as sins, like uncorrectable mistakes. So, the whole sin and punishment thing is out the window. It's, it has no validity whatsoever, but we can start to think of, of mistakes and correction. And it's good, it's actually healthy to, even when, when there's a sense of remorse, like, oh, it was terrible. I, I thought a terrible thing, or I said a terrible thing, or I did a terrible thing, and then there's a sense of remorse, like a sense of sadness or regret or whatever, still that's just a contrast experience again to then say, oh, remorse calls for correction. Grief calls for correction. Sadness calls for correction. Shock calls for correction. Horrific feeling calls for correction. That's, that's really the point of everything, and, it, and you have something that's a real alternative there to punishment, which, you know, God doesn't know of, and, and really it's, that's quite arrogant to hold on to that, that concept, that belief. But we do need interjections of, oh yeah, that's right, correction. If I give this to the Holy Spirit, he will correct, he will correct the error, and he will correct all the consequences, all the seeming consequences of that error as well. Almost like if they all spun out, he can just pull them all back. Kind of like, you know, in that, that movie, um, Tron. Tron, yeah. Tron, he, it, when he puts his hands down, and, and then it, it draws the whole, you know, error, the whole projection back, just like with the great force. And that's, you know, that, that's what you have to focus on.
it's great that we we can really shine and share the good news when I see a movie like that and you see Fred through the whole movie and then Fred's you know finally coming into this place where he's he's like I have an ego I have a, I'm arrogant da, da, da. and people start smiling and reaching over and holding him tap tapping him on the back and everything like this and because it's like you know you can start to really zoom into how adorable everyone really is and how you so much want to extend the good news of freedom and innocence and happiness to all of these you know instead of seeing them all in what the bleep and all these kind of things you get to see a bit behind the scenes and which is so beautiful because they're just you feel they're adorable they're just calling calling that's why we're here to share the good news, you know. That's why we have these collaborative projects and we welcome people, we extend things because, you know, it's, you just never know. I mean, Gabby Bernstein told me she used to stay up late at night and, and just couldn't sleep and all these things going through her mind and just watch my YouTube videos, you know, and how wonderful and helpful it was. I get a lot of reflections back, but but, you know, there's so much that goes into it. You know, I happen to speak it, somebody happened to record it, somebody happened to edit it, and, and you know, go to do all the subtitles and, and transcriptions and books and, and on and on and on and on, intros and outros and all these things. Where it's just like a symphony of collaboration that comes together for somebody up late at night going, thank God, that's just the thing some people write and they say, it's the funniest thing, every time there's a Living Miracles virtual broadcast or a YouTube or a Spreaker, I just, whenever I have a problem, I just turn on something and it, the answer is right there. You know, thank you for doing what you're doing, because it's like, wow, this is a great pathway to God. I have an issue and then boom, the answer is given, you know, immediately in some way. That's rewarding that, that we would even let our doings be guided by the Spirit in a way that they could have such instant, instant answers come. Instead of hacking and searching and, you know, all the things we've tried, journaling and all the stuff, you know, try to get down to it and then boom, it's just so quick. That's what we have in the movie today, after the movie, people just sharing and somebody Couple of people said exactly that. It was just what they needed. Just the right yeah, I love hearing that. You never get tired of hearing that. Just what I needed to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Hear their voice go up a couple octaves. They're so excited. Yeah. <laughs> shocking to point out how valuable a context we have actually. It goes almost even nauseous. It's like, you gotta be kidding me. But like grateful at the same time. So it was you got to go through film. You took your pilgrimage to That's, India. I totally felt that. With all of the progressive thinkers. <laughs> <laughs> you got your ashram experience and... Two hours. <laughs> <laughs> in two hours, you should teleport. <laughs> yeah, you did teleport. I teleported. You really did. <laughs> you teleported to India. Yeah. Even the Dalai Lama. Yeah, come over here and I'll put something over your neck if you want. I just want. We'll, we'll just come. <laughs> <laughs> no. We were just reenacting. You can't, you can't take it off for three weeks. So. <laughs> <laughs> the holy side. <laughs> the holy side. <laughs> it is striking. It is striking. Yeah, like intellectually, I think I knew, but somehow this was like visceral or something. I was like, 
They were telling Swabby, so looking at France, I'd be like, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> like something about it. So, I don't know. Even yeah, some kind of, I guess I have to take responsibility for this, but I got affected by arrogance too. It's just like, I could just see so much like arrogance in that. It's just like, wow. Like almost along with that goes this feeling of like, Like I like I've been given so much even coming in right away just to be heading out on the road, you know, but given for something much deeper. And that came up, but not for that. And yet like I don't have to do that now or something. Mm. It's like it's all tied in or something. Mm. Like quick. Like yeah, quick. say a thousand years, you don't you don't have to wear the robes and <laughs> the rituals and, and the mosquito bites and, and I mean everything it's all you know it's collapsed it's thousands and thousands of years yeah. you know, just and the feeling that you had even recently where you feel like what all, what all seems to be done here is really it's not for what seems to be the people here now which is what the world would say well what you're doing is you're doing it for your personality selves, but it was for something much greater, like a much greater plan, like a huge contribution for something that's way beyond the body and beyond the five senses. So it's great because this whole thing about a group selected and synthesis and then rebelling against the, the facilitators and process. <laughs> rebelling against the process and all these things. And and then there's this, almost this beautiful voice of Jesus behind it all. This need not be. This need not be. None of this need be. <laughs> you know, save yourself mm -hmm. countless efforts and countless years just to be able to hear that, to be able to start to feel that when you see things just going, the reenactments. I would like how, the, in the movie they would go, they would show Dalai Lama, then they would go to the scene of the all the participants kind of bickering and struggling and this and this and this, and at one point then they just show people dancing around with masks and some crazy loud music and <laughs> children standing naked, you know, almost like like a like a little relief, <laughs> cinematic relief from the the bickering and the arguing of the progressive thinkers. <laughs> These are like the, right, the, same yeah. <laughs> right, the progressive yeah. thinkers. Then yeah. let's show some naked children and yeah. some dancing with masks and some old Tibetan sayings and all, all this cultural stuff, which we've all grown up with cultures. And so when we see another one, it's like oh, yeah. Yada yada yada. Okay, dance, dance, and you're casting out the evil. Yeah, yeah. The, you know, it's seen it a million times, but this is just a different form. It's like, what is this filler space? Are they? <laughs> this is like, you're getting away from the arguing and bickering to throw some B-roll <laughs> in there or something. But in the end, it's all, you know, that's the fun part of it. You can come back to those early lessons. Nothing I see means anything. I've given everything I see, all the meaning it has for me, and it still never meant a damn thing. If, with all of that, it never meant anything. There's something light and humorous about, about that. You can't mess it up, because there was never an it to mess up. That's relieving too. That's, has huge innocence behind it. You can't mess it up because there was no it to mess. <laughs> Jason's taking off his headdress. Oh. <laughs> I can share. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want your socks. <laughs> Use, your your used socks. Even if it's blessed. I had this funny thought cross my mind just about the movie, which was like just 
podcast are about all, like in conflict and all that. It's just the thought passed my mind. It's it's almost like there's a resistance towards uh, like having the mind change about the world and you know having a healed perception. Um, because if there's a healed perception, you'd see there's nothing to be saved. You know, there's nothing that needs saving. Then you'd miss out on getting to be the hero of the dream. It's like it's really, it's almost like there's that thought. It's like, well, if I change my mind about it, then I don't get to be the hero. <laughs> it's just all really funny when I heard that. Somehow, I don't know. I felt like there was a summary in my mind of the movie. <laughs> Yeah, it's quite funny when you think that all things work together for good. When you, this idea of 1959 being chased out of Tibet with and dressed up like a regular person and and chased out and driven, they say driven out. I think, look at how wonderful the life unfolded from being chased out of Tibet. Yeah. You're gonna sit up on a bunch of rocks up at high altitude. You're gonna go all over and hug people and and bless people and. Do I mean it's been spectacular? You know, you couldn't even if the manifesting. You couldn't have manifested a better life. You're just going to stay up and sit in the temple and have people come around and kiss your feet and whatever. That after so many decades of that, you know, it's cold up there too. It, unless you've transcended time and space, you're up there. He got to go out. He's been all over. He's apparently Utah. He's done a lot. He's got a lot of friends here. In Utah, Suzanne was saying that. But, you know, that whole thing, you know, it's a different perspective where you see nothing ever happens against you. Everything, without acceptance, exception, happens for you, for your mind. Everything happens for your mind. And a blessing for your mind. And it's only the ego that tries to see it from a personal perspective that there's some things that are for you personally and against you personally, but, but there's no person there to be treated well or mistreated, you know, it's, it's the same error, either direction, so. And you can apply that gracious healed perception to any memory that you have. Any relationship memory, any thought of abandonment, rejection, thought of being turned down, passed over, blah, 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 just the whole thing. You can apply that same graciousness that everything was working together for your good. Whether you saw it or not, that's the fact of it. So, that everything was there waking you up and you may have judged against some of it, but then in the end you go, oh. Thank you. I don't know if this ties in. I think it might tie in actually what you're saying. This part that jumped out at me in the movie is when he said something about do you just want it to be a quiet monk? Simple. Simple? Simple. 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 And you know, so no, don't don't I can't remember what it was actually, but that line. And then there was this feeling of, yeah. Yeah, I get that. <laughs> it's also there's almost something about that because it's I feel like my my entire life I've it's almost been like almost like trying to fit into a world I couldn't fit into. It's so almost like opting out. Like I'm just gonna give up on this. And it's almost like seeing that as being almost like a symbol of opting out. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not even gonna I'm not gonna play. But then I then I think arrogance or humility, what's the difference? thinking about that, in terms of my own path now, and when am I, am I being, really, am I being humble? Is that really humble when I, when I opt out, or do that in my mind, and sort of say, no, 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 I'm, I'm just going to stand on the side and not say anything, or whatever, like right now, I'm just talking, you know, but it's kind of, it's, it's actually a big thing for me, it's not, you know, it's, uh, I'm not sure I'm going with all this, but it just, it feels really like an important aspect of my healing somehow, to face something in my mind where I've been kind of like, felt like a cowering sense most of my life, and now I'm like, you know, Jesus is like, stop cowering, <laughs> you don't actually have to cower. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's like I, that one woman commented near the end of how what an amazing presence it was, but but there was also this sense of simplicity to it. I would say it's not simplicity in the individual or being a simple monk or anything, but but it is it is the simplicity and the glory of just for one instant just seeing the impossibility of the whole self concept which includes the body and everything in the cosmos that surrounds the body. You know, you start to see the, and in one instant, uh, an experience of the vastness of what's really there. Sometimes people have that through a drug experience, through a through ec ecstasy or ayahuasca or something where they just are like, whoa! It's just, for one instant, all the, everything is is gone. Just like a, a, a giant glimpse into the vastness of of reality, and and so yeah, it's interesting that that this lady at the end was saying that he's he's held so highly, he's so highly regarded, so highly respected, so highly adored, and so on and so forth, and yet in the simplicity of the moment of listening, of just twinkling, of there's like a merge that doesn't have that, any of that adulation or, or whatever. Because, believe me, with all that adulation, the, the Chinese government is not <laughs> holding him in adulation at all. <laughs> it's the flip side, you know, of this anger and, and you'll never get back and, you know, don't even recognize this and this and this. It's the flip, it's all, it's all the self-concept. Salvation, that's what I'm going to do my talk on when I go next month to San Francisco. Because self versus self-concept, and salvation is nothing more than the escape from concepts, and and that includes everything that, that is perceived. So it's, it's quite a strong, beautiful passage about emptying the mind to accept salvation and that the Holy Spirit even exchanges self-concepts, so, so, yeah, as you're being used, there will, there will be, you're not hurled into abstraction, you, you get little stepping stone self-concepts. Each one's a little more, seemingly, than a little broader, a little more vast, a little less limited than the previous one, and so, it's kind of like a ladder, symbolic ladder that goes back. So you, yeah, it's good that you can just notice that if you try to defer or play small or or <coughs> hide or anything, just to pay attention to that, to notice it, to be more conscious of it, and then say, "Show me, show me." Show me Saint Susan. <laughs> okay, well, that was another great one. <laughs> Saved another thousand years. <laughs>